Uh, could perhaps we rename ourselves with our specialties? If you want, yeah. If you want to add that at the end of your name, that'd be great. I'm curious. Okay. So how do you how do you do this? Um, um, Mary, I can go? do it. I can do it for you, actually, if that well, helps. I always go by Crab Lady. <laughs> <laughs> I'll I'll add that. <laughs> we do need the the initial taxonomist uh, <clears throat> designation for the second breakout session as well. So if you can leave that on for sure. the second session, that'd be great. But it would be awesome to know what everybody else is doing too. Yeah, because I see names here I don't recognize, and I'm really curious to uh, to know what groups people work on. Oh, we got a note from Dougal in the Just chat. Uh, Lonnie, am I still a co-host or host? <laughs> That's a good question. I don't know. Um, how can I find out? Because <laughs> I don't seem to have, I can't seem to rename people anymore. <laughs> uh, Kakani, I can do that. So if everybody in this room wants to stay as a taxonomist, whoever doesn't have a renamed name, I can go in and do that for you. Is everybody okay with that? And okay. Dougal, someone is a co-host in the main room. Are they having troubles? Yeah, they were having troubles uh, sending people to breakout rooms and other things because nobody had uh, access after you left, is at least that, what they were saying. <laughs> I don't want to hang out in the, in the main room. Oh. Our numbers are still going up slowly, Brian, but I think we could probably get started. Um, because they're very slowly changing now. I think the, the flurry of activity is done. And you are still muted. Karen, I'm going to share my screen. And I know you have some slides in the talk, so you can just tell me to advance them. My keyboard is not cooperating. Hold on. So I just want to double check to everyone that FathomNet logo is correct direction, right, on the screen? Because when I look at it online, it's backwards and everybody else's is correct. But I'm better sure that it's correct, even though it looks really weird. It is correct. It's correct. Okay. <laughs> Does everyone see the slide? Taxonomic breakout? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yep. Yep. Good. All right. Well, let's get started then. Uh, everyone probably knows me by now. Um, I'm Brian Schlenning. I'm an engineer at Ambari. I'm a, a lead engineer on the database and the website for FathomNet. And we also have the esteemed Karen Osborne from the Smithsonian. Karen, do you want to introduce yourself? Um, yeah, I'm Karen Osborne. I'm a curator of polychaetes and paracarids at Smithsonian Natural History. And uh, I got involved with FathomNet a couple of weeks ago. So um, hopefully I can answer most of your questions uh, or some of your questions and we can learn together. Um, but I think this is a really amazing project. So I'm happy to put some time to it. And I'm so happy to see all of you guys here. Many names I recognize, many names I don't. I'm looking forward to getting to know everyone. So that's me. Oops, okay, Karen? Um, yeah, so before we kicked off, uh, Brian's going to walk us through how to do the things and show you all the different kinds of things you can do with FathomNet. But before we did that, I thought it would be um, important to give you some ideas of why it's really interesting and important for you guys to be here specifically. Um, FathomNet will allow us to access data on marine animals that includes diversity data, biogeographic data, behavior data. You know, if, if we can get all the images of all the underwater animals that are out there into this database and we can easily search for them, we can help identify them, we can use all of our collective knowledge about these things to get 
identifications on here, great, and get the pictures of the animals that people are interested to the people who are interested in them. I think that will be an amazing thing. I've spent a lot of time identifying pictures of things for people all over the world, and then those pictures disappear into nowhere, never to be seen again, no idea where the animal is or what happened to that information. And so I love this idea that everything can be in one place. And I love even better the idea that we could use machine learning to help us find the pictures that we're interested in. And the more that we as taxonomists put into this, the more that we're going to be able to get back. So um, next one, Brian. Um, so that kind of feeds into the, if we, if we build FathomNet and we contribute to it, it will build and enable um, us to access more and more data. Um, and I really like the way that they've built in a lot of safeguards there to be able to track whose data it is and who to contact about images and, you know, who to collaborate with to describe these animals and, and use the data that's in there. Next one, Brian. It's also going to be a great tool to train students, um, our students that we want to teach about all the diversity of what's out there. Um, I have been told that I have a slightly skewed view of what uh, ocean animals are like because I've mostly studied them from looking at them within the ocean, which I'm very lucky to have had the opportunity to do most of my career. And it does give me a little bit different view than now that I'm at the museum looking at things in jars or things that come up in nets and things like that. It's a very different perspective. And so I would like everyone to have this perspective of what things really look like in their natural habitat. And so this will um, open up and democratize um, all of this data. And I think that's fan fantastic, Brian. And it will help us as taxonomists do our research because it'll help us find animals and observations that we're interested in, um, possibly animals doing different behaviors and things like that, or in different new places we didn't expect to find them. And the way that they've built in um, the data tracking, it allow us to have conversations and for those conversations about those animals and trying to figure out what the idea is or what the animal is doing, um, it allow us to keep keep those and people will get credit for their contributions to those conversations. So these are just a couple of the reasons that I think that we should be involved with FathomNet and that I hope that you also agree. Um, later in the session and certainly in the second session, we'll have lots of opportunities to talk about other, other reasons, other use cases, um, other ways to use this data, but this is just to kick us off a little bit and kind of set the groundwork before Brian shows us all the fun bits of what we can do and how to do it so we can get started. So with that, Brian. Oh, I skipped that slide, sorry. <laughs> so these are our discussion uh, questions for later, just to get us going. I don't think with this group that we'll have too much of a trouble um, keeping a conversation going for the short time that we have, but um, these are the questions we'll be looking at later. And you can also see them in the in the document that's linked in the agenda. Um, so you can be thinking about those on your new break or. Okay, right. and, and we'll be reviewing those at the end uh, before those discussion break out. Yep. All right, all right, thank you, Karen. Okay, uh, just to reiterate, as we demonstrate these features, uh, keep in mind, uh, this is our first release of FathomNet. And again, we built this thing with our idea of what we felt the community needed, for sure we got parts wrong. And so that's where your feedback is incredibly valuable to us so that we can improve it and make it more useful to you. So that is actually one of the goals of this workshop, of these breakout sessions is, you know, what features do you need to make this useful for your work? Uh, so during the session, some things I'm gonna cover are just how you can contribute your own expertise to fathom that, you know, your as taxonomists and scientists, you know, we, uh, we really rely on your experience and your knowledge to help improve the data that's in there to make it actually a, a really gold standard data set that will uh, better enable machine learning for the entire community. And, and the big picture goal also isn't just to, uh, you know, organize pictures for the marine science community. One goal is to bring in machine learning groups from outside. If we have this massive data set that they could just take and run with, they could actually solve a lot of our problems for us practically for free. And that would be just 
uh, great because in the marine science community, we're, we're always struggling to get engineering resources. And if we can get those resources essentially for free, that would be fantastic for us. Uh, another topic we're going to cover is just publishing your own data into Fathomit, you know, how to do that. Uh, a lot of you have these great image sets that you've already labeled. Wouldn't it be great if you could make them available to the entire community? And then, of course, just to reiterate that our goal here is really how can we make this Fathomit a better tool for you? So a few ways that you, we have currently set up for you to contribute. One is, you know, we've got all these labeled images. You guys are the experts. Uh, if you could come in, take a look at things, you know, correct the worms or whatever your, your area of expertise is, that would be amazingly helpful. Also, for machine learning, what we really are, our goal is to get these what we call full coverage images, which means that everything, every organism in the image is labeled. Uh, that is not true for all the images right now. And so, you know, if you, you or your students, or your fellow researchers took the time to enhance these images, that would be uh, uh, very useful for the whole community. Uh, also, you know, we've got our experts at Embari, other groups have their experts. We don't always agree on what names are. Sometimes we get things wrong. And so, you know, if you have a specialty, it would be great to go in and verify that these identifications are actually what we say they are. And of course, just getting back to the whole goal of Fathom, that is to share these images with the community. So if you have them, we would really uh, love to be able to have you contribute those to the data set. So the first step in getting involved with Fathomit is you got to create a Fathomit account. It's very simple. Right now, uh, you can log in using a Google account. And then once you log in, you can add details to your profile. Now, as part of this breakout, some feedback we want to get is, you know, what are other ways you might want to log in? Do you, you know, one suggestion that we've already heard is, uh, well, we want to be able to connect our ORCID ID to our Fathomit account. And so if you have additional ideas, we'd love to hear them. Um, we're happy to work with you and improve that. So um, to create an account, it's really simple. If you just go into Fathomit, if you go up on the top, there's a sign in, sign out button. You can sign in using a Google account. Once you're signed in, you can click on the little icon of yourself and that'll bring up your profile. And the profile has a bunch of fields that can be filled in. Um, for example, you could fill in your organization, what your job title is, and a little bit about yourself. And really, if you do this and take a few minutes just to fill in your expertise, that really helps out everyone because they, it informs them who you are and what your expertise is. Uh, so you can even put a link to your bio in there or, or whatever relevant information you think is important. And then also for the Fathomit team, right now we're, we're unwilling, uh, I, I'm not sure how to say this, but we're reluctant gatekeepers. We realize that we wanna keep this gold standard. We don't wanna give everyone right access to, to change things. So by filling in your bio, it helps us learn a little bit about you and what your expertise is. And that will better inform us so that we can give you uh, moderator access to make changes to data in Fathomnet. Now, after you create an account, your account by default is read only. You can't change anything. Um, so if you have expertise and you wanna contribute, you have to email Fathomnet at fathomnet at ambari.org uh, with your role. And if you just want to contribute images, uh, you would ask for a right access. That allows you to contribute images and annotations and to edit your own annotations. Um, if you have an area of expertise and you want to you contribute more broadly, you can ask for a moderator role. And we, will, we can upgrade your, your role so that you can edit existing annotations from anyone. And, uh, and one other thing we are looking for also is just feedback on how best to approve people as moderators. You know, we, we don't want to be stepping on people's toes, but again, we are acting as gatekeepers. So we want to get a consensus from the community on what the best practice is for that. Oh, this is just to reiterate. Uh, so you send an email requesting your, your role you would like. And again, we just need a little bit about your background. Uh, we want to also make everyone aware as taxonomists that we have these taxonomy providers, as we discussed yesterday, wired into Fathomnet. And currently we have uh, the two main ones are the Ambari's Knowledge Base, which specializes in, in California coastal uh, taxa, 
and we have the worms uh, database, which is very large and it's a global data set. Um, and just to reiterate what the taxonomy providers do, uh, when you have a taxonomy provider enabled, when you do searches, for example, and you can, uh, when you go to actually run a search, it'll ask you, do you want an exact match or all descendants? If you say an exact match, it will just search for exactly what you've typed in the search box and return the results for that. Now, if you're interested in a group of animals, you, you don't just want to search one animal at a time. You want to do a, a broad search. And that's where you select oops, uh, all descendants. With, and what that does is it'll take the taxonomy provider you specified, in this case, worms. It'll look up all the types of the, the term you selected and extend the search to include those types. And so you can do broad categories. You can search for Skyphozoa or Nidaria or worms or whatever your, your favorite tax are. And uh, so quickly um, return all those results. Now we do have, just to cover the taxonomy providers we have, we have three cur currently wired in. Uh, one is fathom nets. Uh, it is a subset of worms. It only covers animals. Um, we've chopped off all the extinct species. We didn't expect anyone to be annotating those. Um, we do anticipate in the future to add geology and that equipment or anything that's relevant to the community. Uh, again, we have Ambaris, which is our, our VARS knowledge base. We have a web interface on that called the Deep Sea Guide. Um, and again, that's focused on the West Coast. And that does include geology and equipment. Um, and then, of course, we have worms. Now, one bit about using worms, uh, if you it works great if you're at the genus level and you select worms as your taxonomy provider. But if you start to go up the higher level taxa, uh, the worms API is relatively slow. They have a lot of data. And, and again, we're abusing their API in ways it wasn't meant to be used. So it, it can take a long time to return results. So it may fail when used with higher level taxa. So when working with higher level taxa, I would recommend using the FathomNet one. Um, the FathomNet one isn't completely in sync with worms, but we do update it every month. So on the on the second of every month, it gets synced in with worms. And just an example, uh, here's some types of queries that would return results. Um, so if we run a, for those who are interested, if you want to use a naming service and find all the names of say fauna forge, you can use these different queries. If you run it through the FabNet one, you get 770 results, it returns instantly. And bars is a smaller set, 147 results. And then, of course, the worms one will give the exact same as FathomNet, but it takes a lot longer to respond. Hey, Brian. Now, yes? I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I know some people are having difficulty getting their logins to work. OK. Um, good to know. We can talk about it in the breakout group. I'm not going to try and debug it at the moment. but. <laughs> <laughs> OK. But yeah, if you do have trouble with the logins, uh, we can discuss it in the breakout group or afterwards, we can take a few minutes and get you sorted. Oh, that's a note from last night. Hi, Karen. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so we're just gonna do, I'm gonna do a quick demonstration just to show you how you can edit and add and verify data. Stop share. And so I also did all of all of the creating a login and getting verified and all of that in the last couple of days while Brian gets set up here. Um, and yeah, sometimes it didn't save my data the first time or even the second time and my profile like it saved my profile, but it didn't save the data and stuff. Um, but even, like I every time I would go in, I would just put it in and eventually it kept it at some point. Um, so, you know, keep trying. It is beta. <laughs> There's lots of little, little kinks and stuff to work out, but, um, but yeah, generally it, um, it will eventually work or ask one of us. Yes. Uh, in our defense found that did just go from, you know, about 10 users to 250 users in a day. So we're, yes, we have a few kinks to work out. Okay. So just, uh, can everyone see the fathom that website? Gotcha. Good. Okay. So I'm just going to sign out, just go through the whole process. I'm at the FabNet site. I sign in, use my Google provider. 
And now I'm signed in. And the first part I'm gonna just cover is verifying. So uh, let's see, Karen, do you have a tax that we wanna look at? Um, Timoptris is always Yes, there. yes. <laughs> All right, you gotta- uh, you know, I would get some other votes on that one, thanks, Joost. <laughs> Uh, so we didn't label anything with directly as Timopteris. So what's one of the sub the species of Timopteris? Uh, well, it should come up to, uh, you can do Timoptera day, but Timopteris should oh, come there it up. Is. There it is. Okay. So I'm going to select Timopteris. I'm going to select a taxa provider. We're going to run a search for all descendants. I was going to say, Brian, Yost and I have done a lot of localizations with Timopteris. It should be in there. There better be <laughs> okay. some, yeah. All right. It was just maybe a little lag. Okay, so uh, different ways you can go through. You notice there's these little labels here that are on some of the images that say unverified. I'm gonna click on a verified image just to show you what a verified one. There's a nice little badge up on the corner. It says this image is verified, which means someone has gone through, in this case, Karen has gone through and verified it. But this image is not verified. So someone has not looked at it. And so what one possibility is you could go through and only look at the annotations of interest on here and edit and verify them one by one. In that case, you would just say, I'm gonna mark this as verified. Karen, is that true? Okay. And now this is verified by me. And you have to save the change to commit it. So we're gonna save that. And so now that image is verified. And I can just scroll through the images one at a time until, well, they're all verified. You guys have been busy. All right, let's go back to the Explorer and find some that have not been. Oh my goodness, Karen. Okay, here we go. I didn't get very far. I was really playing around with lots of different taxa and I have a lot of favorites. Timopteris just happens to be the most beautiful one. Okay, fair enough. Um, and again, there's a, additional ancillary information. So if you need more context, like uh, depth or location, that's available here. If you wanna see the location of it on a map, you can click on it. Uh, the map can get a little cluttered for some species, but it'll take you to that region to show you where the annotation occurs. So if you need that additional context. Um, okay. Go back to here. Uh, if there's a number of annotations in the image and you, there's, for example, let's say they're all tomopters, you just wanna say, yes, I, I don't wanna click one at a time through these concepts in this bar. You can click here and mark all of these as verified and then save it. And now that'll be verified. So that's one way you can contribute. Uh, I had another note about that. What am I forgetting? Oh, well, it'll come back to me. Uh, another way you can contribute is by editing directly. So you might say, um, okay, let's go back to explore. Anyone have another favorite text that we wanna look at? Ursemia Julie Packarday. Okay. All right, Lonnie. We're just going to do an exact match because that's a species. <clears throat> so we can go through here, and as an editor, you might say, Well, I'm looking at this and going, Well, that bounding box doesn't look quite right, or the species is wrong. You can click on the image itself. And then this allows you to do things like you can adjust the bounding box, move it around, or you can re-edit and change the name here. Now this box, you can type anything you want in this box. Um, it's, it does allow freeform text, but we do provide some autocomplete. It's currently based on Embari's knowledge base though. So it is not a global tax provider. And that's one thing we can just break it, discuss in a breakout. You know, what would you like to see? There are trade-offs, for example, if you say someone's, you know, the obvious go-to is, well, let's just use worms. Well, worms has almost a million names in it. And so there's some trade-offs to using that because it takes a long time for a computer to search through a million names very quickly when you're typing back and forth. So with that said, uh, we're just going to change it back to Ursimia. You can see the autocomplete. And I can change it back to that. And then when you're done editing, you would just click save. Now you might also be walking along and say, you know what? There's another, there's a fish in the top. 
I want to annotate that. And you might draw a box here and say, I don't know what that is, Sebastolobus or something. Except I can't spell as an example. And you can add an additional annotation. So these are really simple tools for you to do. And then once you've done one, if you, you can save it and then you can just move on to the next image at the bottom by clicking next. And I'm gonna continue without saving because I'm not a taxonomist. Okay, now if you've done editing and you wanna exit out, you can click on the image details at the bottom and that will return you back to your search. <clears throat> All right. I'll just top in with a quick, uh, quick idea here is that what I was doing when I was looking around when I first started exploring was I would pick like a family that I was interested in, not just a particular species or a particular genus and um, put the family name in and then get all the results and get all the descendants of it. So I could see all the monopsids that were there and go through. And oftentimes they're only annotated, right? They've, they've been identified to the lowest taxon of the person who annotated them, but maybe I can annotate them further and then I can go through and pull out the ones that I'm particularly interested in stuff. So that's a nice way to kind of explore around um, is using that all descendants and kind of a higher taxonomic level. Uh, and you can find the images that you that aren't necessarily going to pop up already. Uh, that's a great point, Karen. And I just want to illustrate a little bit about uh, when you're typing in the autocomplete box, what you're actually seeing there. When you type here in the this autocomplete, this only shows you names that actually have been annotated in FathomNet. So you're not going to get all taxonomic levels. So to do a search like Karen suggested, you might want to take a you know some uh, come on. So I'm going to take a taxa, in this case, Timopteris. And if I want to go up the taxonomic tree a little bit, I can click on this map button. There's a little folded map here. And then there's the two lollipops. We, we have to figure out a better icon for this. But this will take you to a taxonomic tree browser. And if I click on that, it's it'll show you whatever you selected in the what box. And if you want to move up to a higher taxonomic level, you can just walk up the tree a little bit, um, select your level that you want. And then down at the bottom, you'll see a little search button will have appeared. And you can click on the search button and you can say, well, I wanna only search for exact match or I'm gonna get all types of Arantia. Forgive, forgive me if I'm butchering the name. And that will extend the search down through the entire tree listed here and return the results. Now, again, right now, this tree is based on Mbari's knowledge base. Um, again, until a week ago, we didn't have a fast worm server. So our plan is to integrate the worms tree into this uh, portion here. Okay. All right, Karen, am I missing anything here? Are there any tips that you wanna add? No, I think, I think that's good. It's it's good to just kind of jump into FathomNet, you know, after <laughs> after this and play around and look for your favorite taxon and see what you come up with. And moving around in that taxonomic tree is really helpful um, because, you know, like Brian said, it is based on the Ambari um, taxonomic tree, which is, you know, pretty well up to date, but worms changes <laughs> monthly as they put in all the updates and stuff. So the Ambari one is not as up to date as worms and unfortunately yet, they can't use the worms one. It's also huge. So, you know, if you're looking for something specific and maybe it's changed recently or something like that, you know, you might have to dig around in the tree a little bit to find what you're, find what you're looking for, or find, you know, which levels are in there that you want. Um, and I, I love having this little gallery over on the side because you can, you know, can page through them quite quickly until you find the, the types of images that you're looking for, the animals that you're looking for. Um, and oftentimes you can go in and, and add, um, increase the taxonomic level of the identifications that are there. You can verify that they're correct or whatever. So I found the taxonomic tree once I found it really helpful um, for navigating around, but that's it. Uh, it it's it, also, it, you'll probably do the regions too as a little demo, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, and I just want to mention one other thing, uh, two, two actual things. One is uh, one, the this tree on this, on the left isn't just organisms. We do have, you know, other 
things in there like equipment and geological features. And you can actually run searches with them currently. So I can run a search of geological features and it'll bring up the features that are listed in the knowledge base. The other thing is just to reiterate is when you're editing, if you say uh, you're, you're typing and uh, the, the autocomplete isn't showing what you want to type, you can just type whatever you want. Uh, you don't have to rely on autocomplete. You, we do allow freeform entry. Um, and that's another thing we have to talk about. There's a danger with freeform entry and that allows people to make typos. So we can have a discussion about that in the breakout section. Uh, now, as Karen pointed out, we do have a regions, uh, search by region. So if you're an, you have expertise in a particular region, you can click here, select your region of interest, and then do just a search using just a region, and that will return whatever images are in that region. Now, again, so far this data, this Fathom has been seeded with data from Mbari, so it's pretty much all West Coast data and a little bit of Hawaii data. Um, as people add their own data, it'll expand throughout the globe and other regions will fill in. But the regions here are based on marineregions.org. So it's a global regions data set. So you can you know, choose whatever region you want. It, it will zoom to that area. I don't know where I just went, Amazon Canyon. Okay. All right, Karen, unless I'm missing anything, we're gonna move on to submitting collections. Is there anything else you could think of? I think that's good. Once Brian um, gets through both of the demos here, we can go through this again and people can ask questions or play with it. Um, so we'll have plenty of time to, to cover anything that's not working for everybody. I've got real quick one question for the session leaders. Um, there's been a, quite a few good suggestions already in the, in the chat. Do we want to sort of defer some of those for the brainstorming session so people can detail their suggestions a little bit more and we can take notes on them? Um, or do we just want to keep them streaming? Um, I would say keep them streaming. And if the note takers can grab those out and Adam, there's a, in the workshop uh, file, there's a place for community suggestions. And if you can add them to there, because yeah, there's a lot of good suggestions coming up and questions yeah. that we will uh, talk about after this. And if somebody can kind of organize what the questions are, then we can get to those two once Brian's done. Thanks, Just. Okay, let me go back to my talk. Oh, we got, got a little ahead of ourselves. Give me one second here. Thank you for your patience. I am getting there. Okay, let's get back to where we were. Okay, so this section, we're gonna cover how to publish your own data in a Fathom Net. And we try to make this very simple. And um, now to start with, what we're currently looking at is in situ underwater images. Um, and we. We want both iconic images, for example, the image on the left where you have this nice picture of just the organism in the shot, but we also want non-iconic images, you know, the type of images that your, your cameras are actually going to see, because we, that's how we want to train our machine learning algorithms. We want to train them on pictures that you're actually collecting in the ocean. And so this is the same animal, well, same group of animals, I think. I know we're taxonists out there can be particular about this, but uh, um, yeah, so we want both these type. Now we do get questions about, you know, do we take drone footage, aerial drones? What about bucket pictures? And that's something we could discuss in the breakout sessions. But right now our focus is in situ underwater images. And again, we did not design 
type of it to be your primary annotation tool. Uh, there are some great tools out there already. We encourage you to use whatever your preferred tool is. Um, and I forgot to include Tater on here, of course. But once you've uh, annotated your tool, you can, should be able to export that out, uh, your data, and then look, import it into FathomNet. And then once it's in FathomNet, of course, I've already demonstrated there's lightweight annotation tools so the community can refine or add additional annotations. So we might want to change from a genus to a species, for example. Now, this is a, uh, we found this to be a bit of a roadblock, but just the current design of FathomNet is you host your own images or you find a place to host the images. We're, we're not taking everyone's image sets um, for a variety of reasons. And so you, the onus is on you to make your images public somehow. And, and again, we could discuss this in the breakout, but there are, are a lot of options. Um, if you have an institution, maybe they can help you set up a web server. That's a public facing web server to put images on. Uh, you can also just upload your images to Amazon S3 or some other cloud provider, make that S3 buckets public and voila, your images are out in the world. And we are also working with NOAA and the National Centers for Environmental Information to, uh, to um, so that they would host images or other groups' images. Uh, that's still a work in progress, but that's a possibility where you could submit your image sets to the NCEI and then register them and fathom it. Now, once your images are public somewhere, the next step is you, you upload a CSV of your annotations to fathom that. Now, the reason we chose CSV is it's a, a super common, easy format for most groups to work with. Uh, if you're used to working with Excel, for example, you just export your, uh, your spreadsheet as CSV. And what I have here is the absolute minimum example of a CSV file that you could upload to FathomNet. And oh, when I say CSV, I mean comma separated values. So you have columns and each column is separated by a comma. The first row of a, the CSV file is a header row. It just has a name that tells you what each column is. Now, when you submit data to FathomNet, the order of the columns doesn't matter, but the names do matter. And we have a document that describes all of them, which I'll link to uh, in this talk and also in our um, other documentation that we have. Uh, but I'm just gonna walk through it very quickly. So in this minimal example, we've got the, the header row and two data rows. And one column is the concept. And this is the name of the annotation. So it could be you know, your species name, it could be a geological feature, whatever you want. But this describes what the annotation is. We have another column that's the image. This is the URL to the image that the annotation belongs to. And in this case, you'll notice uh, we have two rows with the same image. That's it. That's A-OK. -okay. You can repeat that image as many times as you want. All this means is We've got two annotations on the same image, one of Nonomia by Juga and one of a rock. Then we have to define the bounding box coordinates. And I'll tell you what exactly what those are, but these coordinates are in pixels. Oops. So we have an XY, which is the origin of the bounding box. Um, so it's, and then the width and height of the bounding box in pixels. And what I mean when I say that is, these are, this is the image coordinate system. Image coordinates start with the origin on the upper left corner, that's zero, zero. Uh, plus X is going to the right and plus Y is going down. And so I've illustrated a pixel there of, you know, X is 80, Y is 50. And when you submit your localizations, you would use that coordinate system too. So in this case, I, we, X is 20, Y is 30. And then we define the width and height in pixels. So the width here is 30 pixels and the height is 40. And that gives us the bounds of our localization in the image. We do have lots of other fields that we accept in the CSV file, and we encourage you to use these. So for example, we have just general info. Uh, we have a column for alternate concept. Alternate concepts we are currently using to localize parts of an organism. So it might be the nectosome of an anomia or the house of a larvation. So the primary concept there would be larvation or uh, bathocrideus and the alt concept might be house. Uh, we have imaging type. Uh, this is just to describe the type of fields. Currently, for example, we just have them tagged as ROV, but 
It could be uh, you know, low lights, um, dark field. You know, we're, we're open. We, we need feedback for you of what these imaging types should be so that we can provide advice to the larger community. Uh, we also have a column for observer. This is the name or email of the person who actually labeled the annotation so we could track uh, you know, who's contributing this, who, who, who's the expert that identified this. Uh, the user defined key is a special key. For example, in your data source, you might have a database key and you wanna know exactly which um, uh, annotation in found that refers to the annotation in your own system. Well, you can put that information in the user defined key. Uh, we have time and position. So a timestamp, that's when the image was recorded in C2. So it's a, a date timestamp. And then of course, depth in meters, latitude, longitude, and decimal degrees. And then altitude, this is actually altitude above the ocean floor and at altitude above the surface of the ocean. We do support environment variables, salinity, temperature in Celsius, pressure in decibars, in oxygen in milliliters, liters per liter. And then for some people who are a little more hardcore machine learning folks, uh, there are three common tags that are used, uh, occluded, group of, and truncated. Occluded means I've localized something, but there was something else in front of it. Group of means I localized something, but it's actually not one item, it's 10 items, for example, a school of fish. And then truncated indicates that I localized something, but it was cut off by the edge of the image. And so they're just, very common machine learning hints. Okay. And then once you have created your CSV file with additional columns, oh, and one other thing I should mention, oops, going back, that's what this tag I went. Um, if you add additional columns in your CSV file, like that don't match any of the existing column names, that's okay. And they will actually, appear in Fathom as tags on the image itself, not on the localizations, but on the entire image. So we've tagged, for example, we've tagged many images with a source column. And that just tells us that, you know, the original source for this image was from our VAR system in Ambari. And you can add additional tags. Again, I use the example of, if you do like quantum flux or who knows whatever parameters you have, you can add those just by adding additional columns. Okay, now to submit uh, localizations is a pretty straightforward process. Um, you go to the FathomNet site, and you can click on My Collections at the top of the FathomNet page. And this will take you to a My Collections page. Okay, and this will list all the collections that you've already submitted. And once you're there, there's a nice big, big button that says Add Collection. You just click on that. And that will take you to this page. And it says Upload a CSV file. Now this page will allows you to enter Darwin core metadata describing this data set you're about to submit. And there's some required fields that, you know, such as the rights holder, the owner institution code, uh, basis of record, et cetera. And these will mostly be filled in for you ahead of time. Uh, feel free to change them as you see fit. There's also a number of optional fields <coughs> that adhere to the Darwin core standard. If you wanna know more details about them, uh, you can see that each field has, is in blue. If you click on that, that'll take you to the documentation that Darwin Core that describes the kind of information that's put in there. Anyway, once you've filled out all the, the Darwin Core metadata that you have, you, just, uh, you can link your file down at the bottom by clicking on the file endpoint um, and just browse to your file on your local computer and then click submit. And that will upload it to FathomNet. And your data will appear within a few minutes in Fathom. It takes a couple minutes to parse and load your CSV file. And then when you go back to my collections, you should see your new submitted collection listed there. And again, once you've viewed your, you can view your collection and you can see all the Darwin core metadata you submitted and all the images in that collection. And I give me one second here. And that's all I have to present. Karen, do you, is there anything I missed or anything you should think I need to cover? Nope. 
I think that's pretty good. Do people have questions? There's a lot of questions going in the chat. I was trying to answer a few of them, the ones that I know the answers to, and Yoast is busy answering questions as well. Um, so I think we have plenty to talk about. Um, but if people have questions, I know that people are having trouble getting their profile information to save. Um, I had that problem too, and then it turned out that Brian was fixing a bunch of stuff on the database at the time, and so that's why it wasn't necessarily going in. And probably right now it's because so many people are trying to, to enter uh, stuff, but maybe just try uh, again at a later um, at a later time. And I'll take a look at it during the break and see if there's something funny going on. So there's tons of great suggestions in the chat um, about things that we would like to do and things that would be great suggestions to do. Um, Mary, I know you needed to leave early and I don't want to put you on the spot, but do you have any specific questions or something that you want to know or you're curious about or something well, before a, you have to run off? Can you hear me? Yep. Does an enormous database through NOAA ship the Okeanos Explorer, but I don't know if they have any records of exactly where each one of those photographs was taken. They are pretty reliably identified. There are also two rather large photo databases, somebody in Alabama and somebody in Florida, but I don't know who they are. And we don't, we don't keep one here at AM. We do have some older material, but we would have to scan all the slides before we could do anything with them. So it can take a long time to do that. And there's another problem which I'm running into, which is copyright. We do get photographs here with specimens from some of the various underwater photographers. And there's lovely, lovely photographs, great data, but they're copyrighted. And the copyright would be permission to me to publish in a scientific journal, in which case it would be available through the journal or whatever the, the particular institution is, but it's not for the open public. Also, there's a problem with some of the foreign universities, especially the Galapagos, trying to get permission to do anything in the Galapagos. By the time you get it, they've changed personnel and you're right back to start again. You gotta watch out. Do, uh... Does somebody from Fathom Net want to talk a little bit about NOAA? Because I know that we have a bunch of NOAA images that have gone in as some of the training data sets already. And that Okeanos is, of course, one of the one of the big places where there's lots of data. And I know that um, other people who are working on things have been working with them to get stuff going. So is anyone from NOAA in the room right now? I can speak to it a little bit, but if somebody from NOAA is here, that would be even better. I don't Go see anybody. It. Yeah, so um, NOAA data, I th if I recall your, your point about that correctly, definitely does have lat long associated with you know all the video, all the images. Um, the issue with the annotations with um, the Okeanos video is that they aren't, they don't have the bounding boxes that you need for the machine learning. So there is a record of annotations associated with the timestamp and there are, you know, the videos and the images, but they aren't in a format that you can actually um, correlate right now. So um, a, probably in the education room, they've, they've been talking about a project with Deanna Soper at the University of Dallas, which has been using the annotations that exist. Um, and students, oh, Tom Horrigan is here, um, who can probably speak more to, um, to NOAA, but that, that's specifically with the Okeanos Explorer. I know that the Deep Sea Coral Group um, has probably a lot of other information. Um, so yes, Okeanos data is excellent, but it's, in, it's correlating the annotations, the bounding boxes, and, and the images themselves that is the, the challenge to getting them to a point where they can go into FathomNet. But it's absolutely our goal to, to do that because they have a lot of fabulous video that is in the public record um, and and they do have those annotations. It's how do, how do we bridge that gap there? Tom? Yes, thank you. Tom Harrigan from NOAA's Deep Sea Coral Research and Technology Program. We work very closely with uh, ocean exploration and a lot of our data comes from the Okeanos Explorer and it does really have some of the best imagery. Uh, the annotations that they have uh, are somewhat difficult to use and 
we don't yet have bounding boxes for uh, you know, individual taxa. And so that's one of the things that you know, our program and others are looking to improve. Uh, Thanks, Tom. Tom, when so you that, those... that's also. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to ask Tom to expand on why those are so difficult to use. Um, some of the, a lot of the uh, identifications which are done, uh, which OER has, which ocean exploration has, and. Uh, they're done, the most recent ones are done in C-Tube. And a lot of those are done live. And so often we have very good experts who are on the line, you know, are seeing those and identifying them and typing them in as the expedition is going on. Uh, some of them are, you know, if there is a an expert for that particular uh, species there. Uh, you know, it's some of them cannot be relied on. Also, they usually just, you know, identify a species the first time it's seen. And so those images are not, or identifications are not on subsequent uh, times that that occurs in the video. In our program, we've been trying to take, uh, working with experts and uh, taxonomists, trying to take images from at least some of those, uh, sometimes iconic images, which is what we've been doing with our uh, colleagues from the University of Hawaii uh, for the capstone work. And uh, sharing those with taxonomists and identifying you know the best image uh in the southeast the more recent uh cruises of the Okeanos explorer uh we've included in our annotations uh an image for just about every annotation however uh that has not been done with bounding boxes and it's only been done for our program for corals and sponges. So it is limited from that standpoint. All right, thanks, Tom. Um, Mary, you're muted right now. And Dougal, did you still have your, you had your hand up for a second. Okay, go ahead, Mary. The Okeanos Explorer cruise is usually recorded. And I'm particularly interested in some of the associations of some of the squat lobsters with soft corals. This university has 64,000 students, many of whom need credit hours. And so they'll call up an expedition and then they just sit until we see something of interest, get a video still, and then go on. And then we can correlate the video still, usually with reasonable depth and location. Now, what else is in the picture? I don't know. If it's a sponge, too bad. We don't know. All that we can do is sponge. But we do go through the things that I'm particularly interested in. I hate to tell you folks, I'm not terribly interested in fish. <laughs> I, I, agree. I agree. She There's likes crustacea. <laughs> Galathates. And you need a lot of detail for those. You do. So one thing that Kakani said yesterday is that they really want to get species level identifications where possible. And that that is true. We certainly want those. but in most of the groups that I work on, paracarids and polychaetes and things like that, that's absolutely not possible yeah, from a I know. from a photograph, right? But it's really useful to have, um, you know, to just even go in there and have a family, right? I can go in and look for all the monopsidae and then I can flip through there and find find the, the videos or the pictures that I'm interested in learning more about that specimen or learning more about that observation. And then that picture can often get you back to a chunk of video where you can go in and, and get more information or you can find out if there was a specimen associated or something like that. And so it's still really, I find it incredibly useful to have those even higher level identifications and stuff. So it's very useful to do those. The other um, 
The other thing I wanted to point out after um, what Tom and Katie said is that Ambari has, you know, 30 years of underwater video and all of it pretty much is annotated, but it wasn't annotated previously with bounding boxes. So that process of going back and putting bounding boxes on, you know, oftentimes you have a frame and there's five things in it that, you know, and five annotations with that frame. And so going back and saying, okay, here's the Aegina and here's the Nanomia and here's the Acanthomonopsis, you know, that takes time. And so when I first searched, I thought all of Mbari's annotations were in FathomNet. And I was like, oh, this is going to be so cool. And I typed in like Nemerdian and it didn't even have it. <laughs> it's like, there are no Nemerdians here. I'm like, no, that's not true. I know I've seen them. I've annotated them myself. But unless somebody has gone through and actually put a bounding box around, this is what it is. And that takes a lot of time. And that's where this you know, something like Tater or programs at universities where we get students involved and, you know, the annotation is there, it tells them what it is, it tells them where the frame is, they just have to know enough to be able to put that bounding box around the right thing in the video and stuff. So I think there's a lot of potential there for um, future projects. Dougal. Yeah, two things, uh, addressing that one just now is the people who can give the identifications are too busy to sit there putting bounding boxes around things. And in many cases, they need to be watching the video rather than the still to be able to see uh, what they need to see to identify the animal. There's a bit of a mismatch there. And currently there's no way within the FathomNet ecosystem to, uh, to pay someone under the supervision of the taxonomist to go in there and sit there all day doing the stuff so the taxonomist can like check it at the end of the day or whatever. Uh, so that's one thing that probably needs to be addressed. The other thing I wanted to, to comment on, which was already commented on with the Oceanus stuff, but uh, just a little bit more is roughly in the same vein, you'd need a deep learning system to be developed over time to extract the useful taxonomic identifications from the chat in the Oceanus. And we spent hours and hours, obviously, watching those dives, giving our IDs. Uh, but uh, having someone, a person go through there, they could follow down as people were identifying the animal in the video. And sometimes it can be minutes and minutes after the observation is made when the the taxonomist comes back and says, oh, I just looked it up on such and such a, a source and it's actually this. And that would be not that hard to uh, for a person to go through and give proper IDs for and bounding boxes. But again, there's no funding structure in place for actually having that happen. And we all know that we're all really busy and are working for free most of our time anyway. So. I, I just want to make a comment about that too. Yes. Uh, funding is a real challenge and it does kind of bring up the whole point of fathom that in that you know any one group can't really solve this problem but by having everyone contribute you know even if you had you know 50 100 images of some particular species and could contribute to fathom that you know individually yeah that's not a big deal it's just a drop in the ocean but you've got 200 people here if everyone contributed 100 images now we've got 200,000 images that's huge so you know i think collaboration is the way forward Uh, Brian? Oh, sorry. Uh, I, let's, I'm I, sorry, Brian, it was Elva first. Can I, sorry, can I actually add to that before we hop into the next question? Okay, um, sure. Because I think, I mean, to Dougal's point, and, and, and you know, our team actually is very, very aware of this. Um, and so what we're trying to think about is like, if we scale FathomNet in the future, right? I mean, today we're talking about this original concept of FathomNet, trying to just to create a database. Now, if in the future we want to really scale up something where we're trying to create a network for, you know, discovery of ocean life, which I'll talk about a little bit later, there is no reason why we can't incorporate, you know, training funds or funding to support the training of these new individuals that are participating in this process, right? But but we have to understand what would be needed in order to do that, you know, and, and how do we implement that? Um, because that would mean obviously wanting to stand up a taxonomy network or an educator network to ensure that, you know, we're, we're, we're targeting the right individuals, we're putting them in the right places under the right mentorship so that we know that we can build that capacity. So by no means, I don't think we have that solution now. I definitely agree with you on that. Um, but as we build out FathomNet, I, I think there's a way to do that. And I also think because this is technology, right? There's, there's a way that we can leverage that technology development where there's a lot of money 
right? And bring in the community or bring in the taxonomy community to help to support it. So we just we just have to think about how we, we do that when we move forward. Thanks, Tim. Elva and then Brian, and then we probably will be out of time and have to okay, go back to thank the you, Karen. Uh, my my comment is, is actually related to what you mentioned of oh, these older uh, video, video footage. Uh, we have many of those and we have collaborated with Mbari for decades. So um, at the end, um, we have not annotated or put it, the, the bounding box around the, the images because we didn't have a system like that. We just created our own system at UNIMAR. And the question is whether we now move to fathom that that would be great if we can start putting those bounding boxes to these older frames and older video uh, footage so that we already start having those images and identifying those groups from from the videos we can do that with students we have all these undergraduate students that are willing to learn that we are training them with our system but we can just put them to train in the fathom net system that's awesome thank you brian i mean actually i've made most of the point i was going to make it just that right now you requiring bounding boxes in order to be uploaded because i realize you don't want fathom nut to be another annotation tool but i've got a team of undergrads annotating falcor video from last summer right now and they're doing all the work i tried to get a bingo server up and running and it didn't end up working so i've just got them doing it old school on google sheets and excel but we're going to extract the frame grabs from the time codes and everything. So the only thing we're missing here is the bounding box. And so if FathomNet in some future iteration allowed IDs or images to be uploaded, or not even uploaded, but I could host them somewhere else, but ingested into the system and then just gone through and drawn the bounding boxes, I think it would go a long way um, because that's that's an extra level of sophistication that a lot of academics don't necessarily have because you have to have some kind of commuter, computer intermediate program in order to do the bounding boxes to localize the thing, which is critical for the machine learning. But since you've already got that functionality in FathomNet to make the modifications, add additional annotations, if you just uh, if we could upload images to be annotated just to the bounding box level. I think you would open the doors to a lot of additional academic labs that may not have the IT infrastructure to host their own annotation server or even use some of the cloud available ones. That's, we hear you, Ryan. That's not, you know, it's not easy. I mean, for example, in Bari, video annotation reference system, all, most of that, what, 99% of it doesn't have localizations. So Absolutely. we can't invest it in the FathomNet. So, so I agree with you. I mean, obviously one of the other annotate, there's a lot of annotation tools. There's, it's easy to get sucked in. Uh, but what we found too, even if we use models to try and automate that process. So like if we already have existing frame level annotations, run a detector on that image and then try to, you know, match annotations with the actual box, there, there's still a level of quality control that needs to be done yeah. and i don't necessarily mean and i'm not i i totally see the problems with the anna with the um excuse me with the automation of it but i i guess what i'm suggesting is think about it a little bit older school like i've got five undergrads doing this that are now intimately familiar with the 250 hours of video and they literally would have made all the things it would take them very little time yeah. to run through and just drag polygons on all the images i just don't have a piece of software that can right. record the images or but record so the, the localization. Is this Falcor data? Yeah. So, I mean, this is something we're we're actually actively working on. So right, right now, NOAA OER data comes into Tater. Um, well, Falcor, no, no agreement has been set up, but for example, and Ben has already demonstrated that the Falcor video data can come into Tater and then be used to do annotations there. Um, but so I, I, I agree, it's a, it's a problem, it's a challenge. Um, but this is, I think, where the community is trying to work towards is like where these different services like annotation tools can link to all these different uh, data data providers so that we can get this information into one place eventually. So, but yes, please, I'm sure we've written down this, uh, this feedback and we'll work towards it. Uh, so we are right. way over time. <laughs> All right, so everybody hop back in and we'll see you a little bit later for the, the individual breakouts and love to hear more. Okay.